Okay, here we go. So this is my, my top 10. So number 10 is the compound effect by Darren Hardy. Why? Because if you are familiar with Jeff Olson and the slight edge, he wrote that book probably in the early 90s, I believe, somewhere around there. Really good book, it's, it, but it, it's, it, it's a little thick and it takes a little bit long to get through it. And so Darren Hardy, when he wrote The Compound Effect, he really took the same core principles that Jeff Olson took from Jim Rohn and he made it short and sweet and very simple to the point. And it, it really helps you to hammer down on the power of compounding consistently like consistency. So if you take actions consistently every day and you're measuring the actions that you're taking, then you can actually chart out your success and you can reverse engineer it. And so this book does a really good job of teaching and showing you how to do the specific steps when it comes to your phone calls, your prospecting appointments, when you're wanting to build and create momentum in your organization, like it really gives you that, that blueprint. So that was number 10. For me, the, the principles there have, have stuck with me. They've resonated for a really, really, really long time. All right, number nine. Number nine. The Go-Giver. The Go-Giver. This is a book by Bob Berg and John David Mann. So this book really helped me when it comes to understanding the principle of, of reciprocity and the principle of sowing and reaping. So a lot of times we will engage with our prospects and we'll start making calls. And, and sometimes, especially if you're in the beginning, if you're, if you're new to business, if you're new to learning the, the skill of sales, a lot of times we're just, we just can't help it. We're focusing on let's close this person. Let's get this person to say yes. I hope they say yes. I hope they buy. And we're not really focusing on what we can give. And it's when we come from a place of adding value that we understand the, the richness of the process of what it is that we do when it comes to meeting people, prospecting, and setting appointments. So Go-Giver for me, it helped me to create some different core questions. So one thing I've been doing, for example, is when I'm reaching out to specific prospects, the one thing I'll ask is, how can I help you have a very successful spring? Like, I'll start with that opening question. How can I help you have a very successful spring? And then they're like, oh, well, I'm actually launching a t-shirt business. And if you could get the word out because it's really for empowering women. Okay, great. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to share your link. Oh, you know, by the way, I, I really wanted to run a half K marathon. Okay, I'll hold you accountable. Like, tell me what your goal is. What is your time goal? I'll, I'll check back in with you. And I just put these little reminders on my calendar to reach back out to those prospects so that I can do what? I can add value. You know, a lot of times in business, it's timing. So maybe the timing may not be quite right. You know, for some of those people that Renee had a chance to sit down with over the last couple of days and talk to, well, if they were firmly entrenched, I'm leaving that conversation saying, listen, I really want you to have a very successful spring. I want to see your business grow exponentially. So if I can be of service to you, if, I, if you wanna have some leadership talk, anything I can do to add value, just let me know. You know, if she ends those conversations with that, and I'm sure she did, with that type of uh, 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 leave behind, well then she's strengthening the relationship. Because here's the thing, some of those people, they, they may never leave their company, right? However, if they're, if they're having success where they're at, Renee and that person could decide, hey, let's let's invest in, in a property together, you know, let's do some other business together. So there, there's so many don't don't ever feel or, or get limited just by the, the club. OK, you, you want to understand that building relationship and building business is about possibilities, right? Possibilities. And give, that's me telling them to be quiet when I do this. That means they're talking too loud. So <laughs> possibilities <laughs> when it comes to all these other uh, venues and avenues that you can go down because you're both having success, you know, in your respective businesses. So I found this to be a really good parable. It's a really good tale. It's a really good uh, um, an instructional guide and really adding value to, to people's lives along the way. All right, that's number nine. Number eight, this book changed the game for me. 
Cash Flow Quadrant by Mr. Robert Kiyosaki. The Cash Flow Quadrant. Why? Because, hey, Ma, tell mom she's way too loud. Like, she's way too loud. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the Cash Flow Quadrant, it gives you the four simple quadrants. And many of you have used it over and over again in your presentations, you've taught from it, and I love the simplicity of it. This is the first uh, um, uh, and like a graph that, that helped me to really reframe my thinking on how I go about earning money. Because when he, he does the employee, self-employed, business owner and investor, and he broke it down and he's like, look, 95% of the population is on the left side, employee, self-employed. So that's linear income exchanging hours for dollars, which means most people are gonna be severely capped on what they can make. They keep hitting that proverbial ceiling on their income. And then on the right side of the equation, business owners and investors, business owner being someone with 100 or more employees, that's someone who is, that's 5% of the population, but they are non-essential to the running of their successful enterprise because they built it up to a point where even if they were to step away for a month, a day, a year, that income is going to continue to flow and investors are putting their money to work for them instead of them working for it. That one simple graph just changed the game for me in terms of how I think, where I want to spend my time, the things that I'm interested in pursuing. Uh, that, that was big. So that was number eight, 1098. All right. Number seven. The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, John C. Maxwell. Again, I know most of you all probably gone through this thing with a fine tooth comb. Anybody that is in the position of leadership, this is such a great um, principled manifesto of constant never ending improvement as a leader. It's something that I go back to over and over and over again. One of the biggest uh, uh, it's so funny, like I'm just looking at the law of sacrifice, the law of big momentum, uh, the law of, of victory, inner circles, connection. There's so many solid principles in here. And one of the biggest ones is the law of the lid. The law of the lid is, is like it's huge because so many times, um, and this is the, I think it's one of the hardest things about being a leader, is continuing to elevate your own thinking and your own expectation and and pushing yourself beyond your current success. I mean, imagine earning $100,000 a month and then setting a goal to earn $200,000 a month. Imagine earning $200,000 a month and setting a goal to earn a million dollars a month. Even though you know intellectually that there's only a handful of people in the entire business uh, space and this particular industry that are making over a million dollars a month. There's not that many. I think there's probably like six or seven that are doing it consistently. But the, the everybody else, they, they usually are going to top off at around 200, 225, right? 200, 200,000, 225,000 a month. That's where most leaders are going to are going to top off by the nature of the business. Now, does it mean that that they're that they're working and they just can't do it. I don't know because I haven't had personal conversations with all those people. <clears throat> but but um, when you when you look at the law of the lid, it means that you don't put your limitations and onto somebody else. So if you have a, a, a team member that comes into your business, if you have someone that comes to you and says, "I really I'm focused on earning six figures a month." Just because you've never earned six figures a month doesn't mean that you're, you, you're, you, you short circuit their dreams, their goals, right? You know, your job is to make sure you plug them into as many resources. And if you have relationships with people who have, who have consistently earned six figures a month, your job is to make sure they can plug into those people, right? Don't impose your lid on your people, right? So you, that's the, that's the, the ongoing challenge I find in leadership is to keep raising the bar on yourself. So that was number 10987. So again, 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. 
Number six. 10X rule. The 10X rule by Grant Cardone. I was fascinated by the title. The only difference between success and failure, the 10X rule. I was like, interesting. So I had never heard of Grant Cardone when I picked up this book. And I started uh, thumbing through the first several pages. I can usually read a book in the first four or five pages to know if I'm going to be interested or not. And in the first uh, page, chances are that if you look back over your life, you'll see that you have wildly underestimated both the actions and reasoning necessary to accomplish any endeavor to the point where it could be labeled successful. That's like the first page. And second page, as I look back over my life, I see that the one thing that was most consistent with any success I've achieved was that I always put forth 10 times the amount of activity that others did. For every sales presentation, phone call, or appointment others made, I was making 10. I was hooked. And this book really opened the, the, the door for me because it allowed me to, to put to words what had worked for me in previous ventures. Because I didn't understand that if I had the same principles of consistency and volume and velocity that I used in entertainment or that I used in speaking, if I applied them here, I didn't understand that I could get similar results, which is exactly what happened. So this is a, a constant companion, something that I continuously teach from. Um, and for those that are really wanting to dramatically change their, their financial lives, if you, if you live by just this, if this is the only thing you have, you, you're going to get results, like period. So let me see. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, number 5. Science of Getting Rich. Wallace D. Waddles. Science of Getting Rich. I had heard um, some grumblings about Wallace Waddles because at that point in my journey, I, was, uh, I had moved off of uh, Think and Grow Rich to the Laws of Success, which is like a, a, it's a voluminous Napoleon Hill work that he extracted Think and Grow Rich from. And sometimes when you read books and you go to the back and then you look at the editorials, you'll, you'll, they'll, they'll reference other books. And so that's how I got turned on to Science of Getting Rich. And it really, um, it really opened up some doors for me. There was a gentleman who actually I heard uh, train on this. And that's where I got the idea. His name is uh, Jerry Clark. He's retired now. But he was a very prominent trainer, one of the few trainers back when nobody was really training in network marketing, but he, he dedicated his life to being a trainer. And um, the science of getting rich really is like the, the, the practicality and the technique and the methodology and the thinking and how it is a science. It's something that if you understand the formula and you apply it in your everyday life, you can reap a, a harvest from doing that. And many of you were, were here when we went through this book. Uh, we spent a week going through it and really breaking it down. And I just, again, something that I constantly, constantly go back to. So I was having a conversation with Mr. Les Brown, and he told me, you got to read this book if you want to really take your speaking game to the next level.